What are we doing, Tom? It's another vloggy. <laughs> Cue the intro. Yeah. Boom. Hey, it's uh, another vlog. We are doing a feature length one this time. Yeah. Like a film. Like a film. you see us at like Cannes Film Festival soon. It may be. The purpose of this hopefully feature length vloggy is going to show you um, a complete behind the scenes look at uh, prepping for weekend events. So it's 20th, 20th of, of July. July. <laughs> um, we caught, caught to 10. Caught to 10 in the morning, yeah. Way too early. We're, we're up at a, a secret location which we'll, we'll film inside in a minute. Secret uh, base. Secret base for uh, picking up materials for costume building. But um, anyway, we're jumping ahead. Uh, yeah, so the purpose of this is to, is to show you behind the, the scenes the stress and the turmoil that, that, and the pain that the staff go through to put on a weekend event for you guys. But no, we love it really. Yeah, yeah it's alright. Yeah. I mean, sometimes. Yeah. When you don't go off into the woods and look for chopping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other than that, it's brilliant. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're, we're going to um, basically be filming a lot of stuff along, along the way, like crafting, paperwork, boring bits as well. We'll, we'll try and make it a bit light-hearted and see, see what we can do. Yeah, it, it should, be, should be an interesting journey. Hopefully you'll enjoy it, hopefully. Emphasis on hopefully. Yeah, big old emphasis. Yeah. What have we got, like um, nine weeks till the event now? Yep. So we've already um, started working on main plot we know what main plot's going to be we started looking at some encounters when we do a, a skype session with vincent and we talk about plot again i might film some of that let's do it yeah let's do I've it i've never actually been in this place so i'm i'm quite looking forward to it yeah like i say it's top secret i, I i'm not i'm not telling you guys where it is unfortunately because it is such a cool place to pick up props um, materials um, all sorts of cool stuff a building costume you never know what is going to be in there but it's kind of like a, a lucky dip but I've never come out of there empty-handed so yeah we'll film inside like I say I'm not telling you where it is it's, it's a, a secret little gem isn't it really so let's do it right let's go all right bye see ya So we just got back from the secret location. We've got a big old bag full of foam and materials. So we're about to empty the kit room. So after the last event, everything's generally brought back to the storage area. And um, a couple of weeks later, we get around to emptying boxes and washing tunics and sorting through all the gear, putting it in the right place. And um, it usually stinks after a whole weekend of crew wearing it. We'll show you. Have a little look. <laughs> show you the kit room. Throw the key out. Look at that. So, yeah. Bit of a mess. It is a bit of a mess. It literally, we just dump it in here, don't we? Yeah. Because after a weekend of laughing, the last thing we want to do is spend another couple of hours sorting through everything again. Yeah, so we just save it for a later date. Yeah. Yeah, Which this is now. <laughs> yeah. This room used to be my old room for practicing drums in years ago. It's all soundproofed. But now it's just full of LARP everywhere. Everywhere. Time lapse emptying the room. Is that a thing we can do? Maybe. Yeah, let's give it a go. <laughs> let's do it!
here's, here's all the stuff. So we can sort through it and check out some old gear as well. Probably about, I think like an hour in. Still so much left to do. But the good thing is we only have two bags of washing somehow, which is pretty good because it's normally about five or six. That is pretty much it. So it's probably taken us about, uh, I'd say three and a half hours to sort through the all the gear. And the last thing left to do is sort out masks from the event. Um, and I thought I'd show you a few masks just while I've got them to hand. So we've got here, we've got like a, a chief goblin mask, the, the titan head, the titan mask. We also use it as, a standard zombie mask as well. A lot of these masks, when we first get them, we buy pretty cheap masks and we tend to paint them up. This zombie one here, for example, like when they arrive, they don't look great at all. They're like real cheap, nasty paint jobs. But then I will repaint them with latex acrylic. They end up looking like this. So a lot more detail on them. One that I've made for the Arag Cha, so they're sort of modelled on like stone uh, creatures. Um, these were carnival masks. Again, these arrive and they're pretty much just like a, a black plastic mask. Quite hard wearing, they don't shatter or anything. Um, and yeah, they're, they're completely painted up. Here's another one here, look. So like generally, the, the good thing with using masks at an event is as much as it would be amazing to paint everyone's faces and use prosthetics and things like that. It, when you're trying to run encounters, you haven't got the time to paint up like, I don't know, 15 crew all as zombies or whatever. So masks are perfect. You can just slip them on and get the crew kitted up and send them straight out. Some little mini goblin masks. Couple of wigs and things. We don't generally tend to use wigs, to be honest. Very rarely we do. Oh, and it's Ingo's mask. Ingo, the rat beastkin, arguably the world's greatest inventor. This is his mask. But for the next event, I'm going to be remaking this because it looks good. It's like it sits on your face, okay, but it's um, your vision is not great with using this mask. And I've noticed when I've been wearing it for maybe like an hour plus, it starts getting quite hot and. And I get a nasty headache, so yeah, I'm gonna rebuild this. Maybe make the, the nose a bit shorter, angle it upwards a bit more. Yeah, so, <laughs> it's kind of it with masks, it's another stone one. Yeah, tons of masks. I thought I'd talk today a little bit about plot. Yeah, excuse my voice, I've got a bit of a sniffy cold. Working too hard on the event. <laughs> Near Thera Saga is a very plot orientated game. There is so much deep plot from the creation of the world through the four ages, through to politics that are going on within the realms, um, things that are happening with the gods, things that are happening with the players, guilds, the various nations, all sorts of of hidden stuff that, that goes on behind the scenes that helps to develop the storylines for the players and also the world itself. It's impossible to write too much plot. I'll say that now. You can write as much plot as you like and it will get into the game eventually somehow. I've written plot for events that players didn't do a certain thing so it, it never even got access. I mean that could be like a couple of nights nice work sometimes. Like you're working on a, a very intricate piece of plot that the players just 
for example, they, they don't speak to a certain NPC, so they don't learn this bit of plot you've been working two or three days on. But you know, that's part and parcel of writing events, to be honest. Basically, I mean, if you want to find out more about the lore, the best thing to do is to head over to our website, put a little link here, and look at the Realms of Neothera Handbook, and in there it details everything about the races, the realms, the, the gods, lovely hand-drawn maps. I'll talk a little bit about the plot for this event. Like I said, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail because we'd be here forever. I say forever, a couple of hours at least. There's so much going on. So this current event, the players have been summoned to an island called Vesthold. Now the Vesthold theme for their realm is basically Oriental meets Vikings. There's going to be like strong undertones of, of both of those cultures going on at the event. Um, everything from set dressing to the plot lines to um, the gods that these people worship. So a lot of background work has been put in to fleshing out this round specifically to be introduced at this event. Hours and hours worth of work has gone in to writing everything from like, the laws to their cultures to royal families right through to the lands, the battlegrounds where a war is currently raging between the people of the city of Vesta, who are the Oriental Viking influenced one, and also a new race called the Dragonkin. These two realms have been warring for thousands of years now. It's almost got to the point where they've been warring for so long, they've kind of forgotten really about what they're fighting about. The entire Caddington estate, where most of the events are held, has been plucked up from the ground, drawn over to Vesta, and laid down a new city. In Vesta prophecy, this island and its inhabitants are going to end the war between Vesta and the Dragon King. As staff, we have an idea of how the war can be ended and it's up to the players to look into the prophecy to look into what the various NPCs are telling them and choose the best way to go about I'd say mediating between these two realms. The people of Vesta are more likely to listen to the players because they're in their prophecy. The Dragonkin, however, well, you know, they still want to fight, except for a small group of rebels who will be looking to end the war as quickly as possible in the hope that both of these realms can eventually get along and, and stop killing each other for the best of everyone. So yeah, like I say, it's kind of up to the players. They're, they're the mediators between the two realms and depending on, on what they decide to do, that's how the war is going to end, or maybe it'll keep going. Where are we? <laughs> B&Q. We're at the hardware store. What are we going to get at B&Q? Um, some foam pipe things. Yeah. I think uh, this long. Foam pipe lagging. We need to build uh, eight stone pillars for the Moon Glen. Do you know what the Moon Glen is? No. If the players open the Moon Glen, they'll find eight stone pillars and they have to place the relics on top of each of the stone pillars to open the gateway to the gods. So we're at b &Q to get some foam lagging, some pipe, maybe some glue and other stuff mm -hmm. to start building those pillars. You didn't know I just filmed you then. I'm trying to think of um, the best size for me. Well, let, let, let's, let's <coughs> do a close-up. Yeah. Close-up. Count them. One. Yeah. yeah. One. Two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Right, he's just gonna show me doing something. If you're wondering, this is not my first time filming. Hello, I am starting work on the 
the moon glen. It's the materials that we got from B and Q, like the plastic pipes, the foam lagging, um, some bits from the secret store as well. Some bits of foam. I need to make eight small pillars that will stand from the ground that the players can place the relics onto. So that's a rough image of kind of what they're going to look like. They're going to be painted up to look like stone. The top part, I'm going to build that separately. So you, you're basically going to have like plastic tube lagging going out through the middle, foam around the outside, um, extra foam added on and then carved. These will be held into the ground by the plastic pipes that we got. Here's the, the plastic cores that will be inside the foam tubing. The main bulk of the foam tubing and the furniture foam, which will be used to add more stone effects to it, carved up spray glue and glue for glue guns. Craft knives, I buy real cheap ones and I get through three of them easily in a night. They'll be blunt by the end of it. I've come a long way so you can see how they come to life. I've finished eight of them and all of the cores are now glued in. These are gonna slot into the ground. So we'll have little holes up in the fields slots in like this and there you go you've got a standing pillar there will be a small platform put on the top where the relics can go onto i've just been working on making the top limbs for the standing stones these were made from foam basically just carved out the central hole there which will slot onto the top of the pillar decided not to fix these to the poles There's a few things like when you're building that you need to think about transporting stuff to the actual event so if i've got like eight of these with the tops all glued on they could get damaged in transit it's just going to take up more room and it could be slid in the back of the car quite easily there's all these little things when you're building that you, you kind of need to think about along the way so anyway the next step with these is to carve the sides and start making it look like it's actually made from stone and once it's painted up it will look like it's made from stone there's sort of stone texturing raised bits that come out of the shaft just to give it more um, depth and detail rather than just being a, a pole sticking out the ground. What I've done, taken the furniture foam, glued it to the, the foam piping and it basically needs to be carved. Here's what I'm working on. So as you can see, I'll start carving into the foam itself with the craft knife and these bulb sections have been carved as well using the same method. This foam is really good to carve actually. It's just a case of literally striking upwards across the foam. 
give it texture. So far on today's crafting session, I've probably spent two hours just gluing in the, the plastic cores into the, the foam tubes. I've done three of the plinths to go on top. I started working on this shaft. I think it's gonna look pretty good when it's done. It's just, it's always difficult with crafting, but you spend hours putting stuff together. This doesn't look great right now, but once it's painted, it's gonna look awesome. It's gonna look really good. So I reckon I'm gonna probably be up quite late tonight, trying to finish off the rest of the, the poles and the shafts, getting those carved up. I normally do like a good eight hours of a crafting session in one go. And maybe every other day I'll be crafting. Day off, doing other things, admin, stuff like that, writing plot, looking at rules. And then a day back on crafting again. Busy, busy. All right, so here's one, let's have a little look. I don't think it's looking too bad. It's gonna look so much better when it's painted. These will be painted with the color of the stone that needs to be inserted into it. So for example, like nature is green, water is blue. The players will need to place the relics, which they've been hunting for for the past four years since we started, into these plinths. update today is apparently flying ant day crafting in the garden we don't own a workshop or anything so pretty much everything i do is done at home in the garden or in the kitchen and i'm getting bombarded by flying ants look at this look at this and over here as well by the glue area and what's worse is they're orange ants as well i'm just gonna have to be careful oh look there's even one on my hand oh. Oh, there's one, there's one there, look. I've just got to sit here and hold this and wait for the glue to dry. There's something to do while I'm waiting. Oh, I know. What is this boy? Oh, it was great, apparently. Glued foam on all seven of these. So now it's just a case of starting the carving to make them all look like this one. For most builds, I will use a glue called Evo Stick, which is, it takes a good 24 hours to dry, but it dries like cement. Evo Stick's pretty expensive. It's like a tenner for quite a big tub, but carpet spray does the job here. So if you imagine once this is all stuck and I come to paint it, so I'm gonna be using latex acrylic to paint over the top of these. And then finally, I flexing them I find through my experience the latex acrylic and the isoflex will hold things together so I don't really feel there's need to use expensive glue at this stage and things like this so it is 9 30 p.m. and I'm still going with the, the moon blend sticks that's what we'll call them <coughs> I have three left to carve I've done five. Okay, it's 10 to 10. Obviously getting quite late. I have managed to do seven of the pillars. So that's all the offcuts of the foam from carving. So yeah, a bit of a mess. I've got one left to do, this one here. And then I can imagine it'll be about quarter past 10. I will probably go in and start looking at some player admin. We're here with Nicholas Brown, one of the senior members and uh, system co-founders. Senior member as an age. Yeah, I would say, <laughs> I'd say these season. I've been around since day one. I'm Tom's dad and I'm Jake's uncle. I've been a like, financial support to start with. The garage is given over to all the kit, logistical support. I love the plot. I do as much as I can on the field now, but um, getting on a little bit now, I do find things a little bit difficult, but I do try and support everyone as much as I can. Nick is living proof that uh, you're never too old to laugh. Is that right? <laughs> Very much. Never grow up. <laughs> never grow up. That's why we laugh. And that's the thing to think about. It's like reenactment, like LARP. It's an escape from everyday life, so enjoy it. Did reenactment for a number of years, English Civil War, Romans. I think Tom started working with somebody that came home with this idea about this LARP. I thought, well, yeah, that sounds quite good. We'll go along to that. We went along for a while. Thought we can do better than that, actually. <laughs> so, so we did. <laughs> Yeah, we used to have workshops up at the Erwin Street Guard, which is a Roman group, and everything was made there. And it's surprising what you pick up. I'm not the most practical person in the world, 
you do pick things up I've made chain mail before which I don't recommend to anybody <laughs> it will drive you mental but yeah you do pick things up learn a lot from the organizational side and setting things up with your own street guard how things are transported how you get things to A to B it's vitally important I always bang on about it but if it doesn't get there it doesn't happen and the logistics of things are vitally important and I learned a lot from that is get that right and your event runs right so a lot of the behind the scenes stuff is as important if not more so than the actual doing because if that isn't right it, it just doesn't happen this is kind of the point in the video we're doing this time is to show exactly what goes into making a weekend event there's, there's so much work involved and it's not just oh we're going to bring along a load of costume we're going to write a few stories and let's see what happens it's literally planning everything how many trips we're going to make and yeah. how many trips back and the time we've got to do it in packing things up and putting it all away again properly the repair of the items that's an ongoing thing try and get it done in reasonable time because you don't want to, again, two days before an event and find your plate armor has got a rivet missing, <laughs> which is what happened a few, <laughs> few days ago. It's, it, it's a good thing. It's nice to see people enjoying themselves and see how much pleasure it brings to people. It's nice and how it becomes part of their lives and that. It's, yeah, it's quite a thing, really. What's your favorite beer to drink? <laughs> Uh, product placement. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm not paid by them, by the way. Soon there'll be a Neo Theorem merchandise with Stellar Artois as mm. our sponsor. Yeah, they are. 10.30. I've done all eight of the stone pillars for the moon clear. I'm about to catch up on some emails, generally from new people that want to get involved in the system. Emails about crewing, what to expect as a new player, setting up downtime forms or character sheets for existing or new players as well. Try and do things within five working days for our email. So yeah, it's um, admin work that goes on behind the scenes. It's like a I feel like kind of like an unsung task. I generally reply to all of the emails myself. Jake jumps on from time to time, but most of it's done by myself. So I'll be emailing back to people, uh, answering their queries, making sure they know exactly what's going on. I think that's a really important thing is making sure that queries are answered professionally. You answer all of their questions and um, in a timely manner as well. Any excuse to slack off and say hi to the fish, that's spot. in the morning I've just finished working on some play unique requests some downtime forms plot for the event I'm knackered to see what happens tomorrow see if there's more plot to do no well, there's always plot to do I won't be able to paint any of the moon glen pillars because I've run out of latex I've ordered some more it's gonna take a couple of days to arrive so emails that's another thing like emails from either existing or new participants that want to know things about the system what to bring along questions about the rules stuff like that my little one Flo she's six she's been to LARP before it teaches them a lot of like really good social skills and problem solving um, abilities as well so yeah I'll spend the day like with her it's a nice break from LARP to be honest like all the hardships that come with it <laughs> and the good things as well she's really good you know she's she tries to help with plot monsters encounters stuff like that which is really good for a six-year-old she's got some damn good ideas it's really hot in the uk right now the sun's always blazing <sighs> what time did i start crafting today it must be about five o'clock like, I'm, I'm literally so tired like it's just like <sighs> it's mentally draining like writing plot dealing with uniques crafting stuff for the system um the other stuff that comes with it is you know things like the the discord channel where you know you're answering questions on there we've got like a real active user base which is is really good and then there's stuff like the rules amendments in the background so you know we've we've just released a new version of the rules the next version that's coming out it, it's not a, a new version of the rules but it's just expanding on certain rules and, and certain things that i'm always getting questions about from a lot of players which yeah, that's fine you know yeah they they want to make sure they've got the rules right which is great so yeah it's it's taking questions on discord or via email uh, Facebook as well it's another thing that I've got to keep an eye on a lot of the time it's a lot of work for one one person doing most of the work it's it's, it's a lot I won't lie it's 
sometimes it really gets to me. Like, it really does. I love the system. I love what we've got. I love the player base. I love the events. I love seeing the smiles on people's faces and the, and the looks of shock, the looks of terror <laughs> with certain things that happen in plot, but it's so much work. It is so much work. <sighs> but it's worth it. It is worth it in the long run. So a big thing for me was a few years back I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, which is kind of, I, I think, been with me since I was... <sighs> I don't know, mid-teens, something like that, but being diagnosed with it and learning how to how to cope with the the mental illness, because we you know, people call it an illness. I don't necessarily call it an illness, sometimes it's a benefit, but a lot of the times it's very difficult to deal with. But LARP for me is a, an amazing escape. It, it's something because I'm constantly thinking about what I need to do, um, how I can make the events better, costumes that need to be made, props that need to be made, uh, looking at the rules, constantly de dealing with people's questions, things like that. I mean, it, it really is a distraction. It's a good distraction, but sometimes it really takes its toll. I mean, it, it really does. It's, I kind of feel at the moment like I'm bearing the brunt of six people's work on my shoulders and do you know sometimes it I really feel it I feel it now in the I suppose like the physical sense and being mentally drained but not not so much that I I, I think I want to stop doing what I'm doing because I don't want to I get all this feedback I, I get written letters from players thanking me and the other staff Jake Vincent for our work and improving their lifestyle improving them as a person and, and that's that's amazing you know when you're affecting people in a positive way like that it's it, yeah it's amazing granted yeah like you, you you take the brunt of it sometimes and with everything i have to do behind the scenes i mean you can see from this vlog what i'm doing for the game it keeps me occupied it keeps other people occupied it's there's so many like positive tales that have come from neothera which is amazing i don't want that to stop but Sometimes it hurts, you know, sometimes it's like, sometimes it's too much. But it's learning to cope with that and it's learning to deal with it in your own way. It's a coping mechanism for me. I can use it as a creative outlet on so many different levels. It's doing the people that come to our events so much good. I think most days I end up doing a lot of stuff, stuff related to Neothera in some form either logging on to Discord and, and staying in touch with the, the player base, answering questions there about rules, about costumes, random stuff. It's just about like staying in contact with people. It's just about them knowing that, you know, the staff care, that I care. You know, like, you can be real bubbly, put up that, like, facade for people and, you know, at events, like, you go around talking to different people and just being, like, a, a different person welcoming because you, you feel like, you know, on the surface, people see that version of you and, and they want to see someone that's enthusiastic, they want to see someone that's got bundles of energy and... They like that, people tag on to that, you know, who doesn't really, but it, it's so difficult because 
behind the scenes there's like a big part of you that's constantly questioning what you're doing how you're writing events how you're building props how the event's going to go and all of these things kind of weigh on your mind it's so difficult to shake off it really is i mean i see it as kind of like a learning curve i'd, I'd say you know i've been laughing since 2012 something like that um I remember like the first near Ferris Hager event, I, I was literally shaking with fear. Going in as the first NPC. I don't even remember what the NPC was to be honest. I, I think it may have been Ingo, I don't know. Brotherhood trash mobs. Oh no, I remember shaking, I was literally shaking. I don't get that anymore, it doesn't happen at all. But it's still that big thing of nerves and just feeling so nervous that sometimes you, you feel like you're going to puke. Just because you put so much time and effort into a project that like you've you poured your heart and soul into it. And it's that reaction of, you know, players when they come to an event, even crew members, they don't know that. They don't know what's being put in behind the scenes they just turn up and, and play or do their thing if their crew get told what the encounters are you know maybe they can write their own from time to time that does happen which is great i'd like to give the crew freedom it's very difficult to deal with with me it puts me on a massive high or a massive low and the only way to kind of cope with that especially with bipolar so you have the the amazing highs the positives, what the players are seeing, what the crew are seeing, and then you also have these like drastic lows. I don't know, maybe crew aren't so clear about something, or, or the players didn't quite get this bit of plot that you spent six hours working on one evening, putting in all the, the background work, that sort of thing. But it's it's staying on the level. That's what I find helps, staying on the level. And always thinking, what if, what if the players weren't this way what the players went that way how would you respond to that keeping your mind occupied all the time it's a very good thing to do i think i've had maybe three major occurrences of burnout at events where i've literally had to go and sit myself down for 10 or 15 minutes just get away from people put my mind back on the right track and that does the world good you know, just like having that little bit of time out to yourself. If you need that time out, have that time out. If you're a crew member, if you're a player, just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to go and sit in an out of character area. You need that time to recharge your batteries. You need that time to take control. It's Wednesday the 24th of July. I've just finished making all the pillars for the Moon Glen. We've got seven pillars here. One for each of the seven element stones to go in. I've just been resting the tops on them for now, obviously, like I was saying. There's a few little areas that need working on, so like here you can see the glue hasn't quite stuck properly. I also think that's partly down to the hot weather we've been having recently. So it's actually kind of melted the glue a bit. I'll work on that before painting. That shouldn't take too long. So in here, you're going to have not necessarily in this order. Dark, light, divine, arcane, and demonic. And here's the stand itself. Similar with the others, this will be in front of the other seven. I'd estimate it's probably taken six or seven hours to make these. I will show you some paint mixing. As most cosplay or LARP prop builders know, when you're working with foam, the best thing to paint them with is a mix of latex and acrylic paint. I mean, I've been building props for the past four or five years, LARP props, uh, painting weapons, repurposing weapons, making big monster props. I know people say there's generally like a good ratio of latex to acrylic to use. I generally tend to do everything by eye. I never really mixed a bad batch to be honest. So I need quite a big jar of paint to paint eight pillars. So I'm literally just going to mix it in a jar. This is from polyprops.com. So it's fairly reasonable to be honest. I think this was about like a tenner for a one litre jar. I'm going to start off with a fairly dark base coat so then it can be dry brushed to bring out the detail. So one thing to remember, when you first mix the paint, it's gonna be a few tones lighter than it will be when it dries. So again, it's always doing it by eye, just kind of estimating what the color's gonna turn out like when it's done. I'm 
we're just putting in a little bit more black because it's still quite a light colour. We want it really dark to give you a really nice base coat, a dark base coat for the lighter shades of dry brushing. So yeah, I'm fairly happy with that colour. Alright, I know it's pretty dark, but I'm outside painting because yeah, I don't want to ruin the house basically. Uh, latex acrylic is really hard to get out of carpets. <laughs> little hint for you there. Generally with like quite a high density foam you can paint onto the surface really easily and it generally tends to absorb the latex acrylic pretty well. If you're painting onto like a lower density foam, the, the blue side you can see here like furniture foam, I use like a technique which is stippling but it's stippling with a, a really heavy brush load of paint. It's going to allow the acrylic paint a bit of flex to it so it's not going to crack. I mean if I was just to paint this with acrylic on its own you'd likely see cracks forming as it moves like in the wind if it was um, bent in transit or like standard art weapons you know as, you, as you're using it as a weapon as you're hitting people the foam itself is going to push in bend back and you're going to start seeing cracks appearing. The good thing with latex acrylic is that it responds to heat so the hotter it is the quicker it will dry. I'm gonna have to call it there I've run out of the latex so I'm gonna have to order some more. Last little tip for you if you do have any latex left latex acrylic left best thing to do to keep it just put it in the fridge it's going to extend the life and you can use it again within the next few days oh my parcels arrived from Mythalon it's the 26th of July um, and new thing new kit new kit for the crew so it's a load of a load of tunics you can never have too many tunics um, uh, another set of green and gold set of robes also some other bits to show you it's going to be part of Ingo's equipment that they receive dismantled and they have to put it together so it's like a working engine it's actually a kid's toy it's gonna look good when it's painted up anyway they've got to completely reassemble it you can take it apart quite easily there's another one be the buzzer puzzle which is going to be part of it so when they want to start the machinery they have to complete a round of beat the buzzer if the buzzer goes off then they're gonna to have to wait five minutes for it to reset or spend a lightning stone getting it started again just have a drink first yeah go on and leave that bit in is that bacardi yeah Hello, I'm Jane. How did you get involved with LARP, Jane? Tom and Nick and Jake all went to an event and they really thought it was really good fun and they decided that they might want to have a go at forming a group themselves and that's what's happened. I do deliveries, driving lots of LARP stuff up to the event, washing. Lots washing of all washing. It. Yeah, lots of washing, bits of sewing, helping to tidy, I clean the cottage. Jane, what is your favourite thing about a LARP event? Watching, looking at all the costumes and how good everyone looks. I've seen all the props as they're made from start to finish, the hours it takes, or, or even Jake in a leotard, perhaps. <laughs> 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 I'd just like to jump in there. It's more suiting a leotard, thank you very much. And I think you'll find that very good in them. Jake, I think it was the time you turned up in a leotard, actually. You should have talked about that. And how many do you have? Do you have two types? Um, we've, we've got three. And you've got, got two. a camo one. We've got a Manor Hunter one and we've got a all black one. The best thing is that sometimes Jake turns up and we're not even going to talk about it that night, night, but he's still got a leotard on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that does not happen, that does not happen. <laughs> no, okay. Right, okay. Need to say, this is, this is gold. This is, this is, yeah. this is quality gold. <laughs> what has been your favourite costume you've seen at all the events? The Manor Hunter. But I did like chalk and I do like that rap one as well. Ingo Raspettin. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, Ingo. I quite like that one. Oh, and also, when Ingo first came on the scene, Hannah had a rap costume as well. That wasn't a rap costume. No, we'll cut that. What was this thing? It was a box. It was a box. <laughs> 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 
Did you see? It was a white rat, Hannah. What's your favourite thing to do at that? Looking after Flo, of course. Flo just walked see. away. She just went. Um, tell us about that time when you played a travelling tavern owner called Ma Brown and you shot someone in the head by accident. No, it wasn't by accident. What happened? And I decided it was time for him to go. Yeah, are you sure? Because I've heard something like the, the gun went off by accident, but no one's really sure. Well, that's for me to know and you to find out, really. <laughs> It was me. It was me. It was me. I was trying to think of my character. Her, her loyal husband. I was, I was really hoping you'd just go, that was my husband. <laughs> And I was yeah, shot. It was my husband. I was only trying to sell yeah. somebody a dodgy horse. Oh, that's why she shot you. Oh, yeah. That's all there was. Yeah. I was yeah. a horse salesman just doing an impromptu NPC and I went in so trying to sell really dodgy there. horses to people in the mm. tavern. Yeah. The Mar Brown took umbrage to it. Yeah. And it, it got a bit heated and she drew a gun and shot me. <laughs> there seems to be a, a running theme about some of your late night NPCs. Didn't you try to uh, sell people some Pegasus? Oh, I have sold them. them. <laughs> they just don't realise they don't exist yet. How, how many did you sell? Three, two, no, two. I think. <laughs> um, on the promise that I deliver them, well, of course, they might arrive, I don't know yet. The next job is to get all this sprayed up in black, ready to be painted with acrylic and then varnished when it's done. So I'll get the sprayed and um, show you a bit of the painting process along the way. That's one coat of black spray on all of these parts. If you're wondering why I'm using a black base coat, it's because when you're using metallics, I always find that they work a lot better on a black surface, bring out the pigments and the paint a lot better. So um, I think I'm gonna give it one more undercoat and then we'll start painting it up. This will be a part of the machine that the players have to build by hand. So basically all hard skills. I'm only going to let crafters do this. Yeah, I'm gonna have a go at building it myself. This is another section to the puzzle. 
because they have to complete. Um, I'm going to have a little go on it now and see if I can do it. Line it up carefully. We're not allowed to touch the wires. Okay, let's try again. And one more time. We have to go around the wires. We're going to, oh, I'm getting further. Oh, I could, could do this. Right, no, that's it, that's it. Not doing it anymore. The base coat is done on all of the pillars and the plinths to go on the top too. That's about a litre and a half of latex. I'm not even sure how much acrylic paint, but I've just gone, gone through it. So now it's time to start highlighting and adding some detail to them. <coughs> I am working on the first layer of texturing and highlighting for the stone pillars. Here's the first layer on one of them. So earlier, I showed you I applied two coats of a very dark grey latex acrylic to the foam. This is the first layer. So I've got like a, a mix of latex acrylic on this brush. I use a technique called dry brushing, but it's quite heavily dry brushed. And it's bringing out all the texture in the foam. So like the idea is to build up the layers, getting lighter each time. So this will be the first layer that I've applied. Um, and then we'll go back over some of the more extreme points of the stone with a lighter color. So anyway, I'm gonna do the eight pillars. First layer of detailed highlights done. Now I'm going to go on to stage two, adding more highlights to these. Yeah, looking good so far. Oh, how did that get there? Okay, it's starting to get dark, so I'm moving on to the second layer of highlights. I thought I'd just try and show you before it gets too dark. I'm hoping you can see this. The next layer is all about adding like a very finely dry brushed layer of the lighter grey to the top of it just to bring out the accents in the stone Hello, it's the 30th of July, 5.30 and I finished off the stonework on the pillars I just thought I'd show you a quick update how they're looking Pretty pleased with how they've turned out So the last bit, I've just got to add a bit of colour in these holes here that relate to uh, which relic needs to be placed in them. So like the dark relic's black, the light relic is white, you've got a golden divine relic, uh, black and red demonic relic, the purple arcane relic. So I'm just gonna add some dry brushing so the players know which holes they have to be inserted into. Hello, it's Thursday, the 1st of August, uh, 5 p.m. I'm quite happy because new masks have arrived for the new race that's gonna be introduced at the September event. So, I mean, if you played the event and you're watching this video after, which you will be, you're gonna know what they are, it's Dragonkin. Um, so, I was looking at like a quick and easy way of, of doing the masks and the costumes for them, and I basically find a supplier of these half-faced dragon masks. Here they are. Um, I've ordered a load of them. Um, they're fairly cheap, to be honest, and you'll kind of see why if you look at the, the paint job. Like, the build is, is great. They're really nice to wear, these masks as well. The actual detailing is really good on it, but the initial paint job is really bad, so I'm gonna have to paint up all of these masks. If you don't mind doing, they're gonna look so much better, but let's take a look. These are the masks as they've arrived, so the paint job is awful. It's really bad, but I'm gonna paint them up. They'll look so much better. But unfortunately, one of the masks arrived and it was ripped. So what I've done is glued it back together with hot glue. Um, the hot glue has kind of melted the foam a bit and is holding it together. And I'll just paint it so it looks like it's got a scar on its face. 
So, you know, that's safe chucking away a mask. It can be used. So here are two that I started painting just to see how this is gonna turn out um, compared to this. Yeah, it's like worlds apart, so much better. Still haven't done the teeth yet. But it's just to see how they work really, how the paint stays on. So yeah, also the colours of them are going to relate to what type of damage the Dragon King will call in combat. So obviously you've got like red calling fire damage, green nature, blue water. So yeah, obviously, obviously I'm going to paint a few up to represent the different elements. Yay, Jake's come over. Well, I I was vlogging earlier before we got here, so All right. gonna try on a new bit of kit. Oh my god. <laughs> oh. Perfect. No, I, I'm not sure this is gonna fit. This is gonna be snug. It's definitely um it's gonna be for Vicky to wear though, so she's quite small. This is a dress. Cut the camera, cut the camera. <laughs> Buying all these Mythalon end of line knockoff. Man, Mythalon is <laughs> awesome. Mythalon is pretty cool. Yeah. Sponsor us please. You can actually get sponsored by places like that. Yeah? Yeah, I was looking into it. Be really cool, just as long as they don't send us broken metal braces again, that'd be nice. That's perfect, it doesn't even need taking up. No. Mike Barley said he's brought a lot of a lot of kit at Empire so he can adjust what vanillic looks like. Looks very cool, isn't it? That's cool. We're doing something behind the scenes here. Here we are. Yeah. So, right, basically, so for you guys on Discord that we're talking to now, we're doing a little vloggy. So in, I don't know, whenever this gets released, after the event, after the event you're going to see and you're going to remember that you know, we're all talking to you. And look, this that's the thing that we were talking about right there. Right see, here. It's really red. It's quite red. Is it a Yoko Ono? Uh, no, it is not a sheet of A4 paper with the word red written on it. Um, Callum has said, I can't wait for the anime cat girl invasion of Nier Thera now that we're, um, now that we're in Oriental land. <sighs> that sounds, sounds quite cool. Tintagel in Cornwall and it's the carnival and we've just watched the parade well this is from the carnival a break from love which is always welcome Mum, um, I've got my hair braided um, Mummy's getting her hair braided It's so busy in Tintagel, I've never seen it this busy I know it's not really near Thera or Lark related but some, something fun isn't there? Look at this So bad taste. So bad taste. Oh my god. Oh my god. Hello, it's the 13th of August, about half eight. I haven't vlogged in a while. It's been really busy, to be honest, and just like really tired and a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. What I have been doing is working on the 14 Dragonkin masks. I'm hoping to finish the last four tonight. Just gonna show you a little bit of what I'm doing, how they're made. There we go, there's one, that's an earth dragon. Uh, there's a couple of ice dragons here. That's going to be an air dragon, it's not ready yet. They have a base coat of latex acrylic, quite dark, and then I dry brush them, work up the dry brushing until it gets quite light to the extremes, kind of like this, so it brings out all the detail. This is Barbara. It's the thing that I put all the masks on while I paint them. Oh, 
Hey guys, it's Saturday the 17th of August. It's about 20 past five. Oh, that's bright. Oh. Anyway, yeah, um, I'm about to start a, another crafting session and today is rebuilding the rat mask that I showed you a while back. Uh, it's for an NPC called Ingo Rasbatten. Probably my favorite NPC to play. So anyway, I'm rebuilding the mask because the old one was really uncomfortable to wear and seeing as Ingo's gonna be a more recurring NPC, I felt it best to rebuild the mask so it's a bit more comfortable. Could have used prosthetics, but to be honest, I prefer mask, especially for Ingo, because he's a character that's constantly in and out of encounters, appearing at random times due to his dabbling in time travel and dimension hopping. So this mask is the base of what I'll be working with. This will be cut around here under the nose so I can breathe and it will effectively be a half mask. I'm going to need a warbler for crafting the end of the rat nose. Foam for building the rat nose onto here. Blue gun. Blue for sticking. We've got black for this will be trimmed down and painted over for texture. And two mil craft foam which will be used to make the ears. Here is the mask carved and shaped. Everything's been sanded down so there's no sharp edges as well. So the next stage is to start building the foam rat nose. It's about 7.30 now. Here we are. The nose has been added and I've reinforced all of the strapping with hot glue. It looks a bit weird right now, but the next job is to layer black fur over the top of the mask. Slight change of plan. I decided to add the ears first. It's made from the two mil craft foam, and now I'm gonna start adding the black fur. I'm not being honest with you guys. There's a ton of tricks that I'm not telling you about during the crafting process. It's stuff that I've learned over the years. It's stuff that I've worked on really hard. I've just learned through trial and error. I've learned through making various different types of costumes. A magician never gives away his tricks. If you're crafting stuff, if you're that into making costumes and producing works of art, that you kind of need to learn along the way yourself. Hey, look, what's that? What's that? I highlight it. Like on the ears where it's painted everywhere, you need to do um some varnish so the rain doesn't make it come off or mm -hmm. something. Good idea, yeah. And here it is. Ingo's mask, his new mask, is done. Let's have a little look. See, I've added whiskers, which was from a very fine thread. And they've just been threaded through with a needle. Good old Barbara modeling the mask. The reason there's a lot more highlights on him, like whiter parts, is because the version of Ingo at the next event is about 20 years older than the last version that they would have met. All right, chiefs, it's me, Ingo Raspetin. And it's a lot more comfortable than the previous mask. So much more comfortable to wear. I think because I've made the nose shorter as well, it's easier to see through. Like those ears are looking really nice, a bit more detail. That's another job done off the prop list. <laughs> It's the 22nd of August. I think I've finally cracked. I think I'm going a bit mad. <clears throat> no, I'm going to show you something. <laughs> um, let's take a look. Uh, yeah, this. So this is a device that the players will be rebuilding from scratch at the event. It's a machine built by Ingo, who is an inventor to allow the players to basically yoinking back from a past timeline to the present. Once that's happened, the machine is gonna be used as an early warning system for any mobs like a cyan that'll be arriving at the estate basically to sap the estate's energy so this thing will be sending out a warning signal telling the players to go to a certain area and they've got a set amount of time to get there otherwise they will lose points off the estate's energy this is an old computer i have to rebuild this thing i think i showed it to you a while ago like painted up that's all the pieces for it. Make sure it's plugged into here. The cooling system, they have to put all these pipes back together. They literally... <laughs> um, a projection unit. To power up the device, they have to do a beat the buzzer challenge. So now I've got to start painting it up. 
Hello, it's Saturday, 10 to 8. We're going to build this thing. We're going to try and fix it. What we're going to do, I've finished it all now, it's all painted up. We're going to do a little test run through of the build. Well, you already know, know how one. it goes together. Well, you know, no, I, I already know one. I already know that one. Okay. Players will have instructions. So it's all got to be done in a certain order. If it's not done in that correct order, I know where these they get go. I think I know where these go. Okay. Yeah. I think my character will just watch. This is not based on Back to the Future at all, I must just add. We don't want to get sued by Fox. Knock knock. Who's there? Boo. Boo who? Boo, why are you crying? <laughs> because the players keep messing up my plot all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Part one, the core. Right, that's the core. That's the core. Various wires need to be plugged into the core. Most of these are colour coded. That's me out. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. I'm out. That's me done. Jake's colour I'm sitting back down. I'm having a look. Yellow Jake. Oh, I thought it was orange. Oh no, I know. Ish. I'm going to do okay. in. So one of these... Oh, I see. ...is not colour coded. We'll do the colour coded ones first. That and then not. see what's left. Right, so oh, I'm wow. plugging those ones. That one goes right. there. Yeah. for the other. No Marty, that doesn't go there. No. Great Scott! Oh, that's one of those two. <laughs> when it's but it's still one? not finished. Yeah. It's not finished. Oh, oh, really this one. oh yeah, that one. Yep. <laughs> the core's been built. That past the hat. Yeah. What's yeah. next? That one. Shetty? That one. That one? Okay. Yeah. Are you doing that one? You got the hat on? Yeah. The Here's protonic the engine. The players oh. need to rebuild this. No instructions will be supplied, so its completion will be done through trial and error. Uh That's it, you've done it. Yeah. High five. The coolant system. Various pipes that need to be slotted together to cool the inner workings of the machine. Can I start this So one? you've kind of got an advantage because you've seen it built already. Well, I haven't seen it built. Don't tell me that. <laughs> That's done. You've done the coolant system. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Oh, that's Bingo. Right. That was the coolant system. Yep. The sub-core generator. Simply plug the wire into the protonic <coughs> engine. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, probably. There you go. We're That'll right. do. Yeah, that's it. That's in. Here's all the plot on my phone. Mm. Secrets. Part five. The time slip <laughs> port. Uh, uh, no, both electrocuted. Uh, uh, you're being too eager. You're too eager. Far too eager. No, I think you're electrocuted again. This should be inserted into the spiral port and the red and green wire connected to the power supply. Yes. So that. Uh, that. Check the bottom of stuff. Does that match it? No. no. Does that oh. match this one? Oh no. Have a look on the underneath of that one. Yep. Like that. I know which way this one goes. And the red green wire. Okay. Dead on dead. Right. Look at it. That's green. Yeah. Where's the red wire? Oh, it's here. Oh, okay. It's like that. All right, that's done. The megaphone should be slotted into the relevant device holder. I said that already. Oh, and it goes in one of these, I think. Let me do this. Well, I was as well. So these get connected, I think. <laughs> well done, Flo. It goes the other way. Wait, I'm going to do something. Flo, are you sure you know where this goes, Flo? Yes. Are you sure you know what it, this is? Yeah, right. So at this point, it's all being built properly. You need to wind the engine 20 rotations. One. Oh my God. Okay. I'll just Twenty. And you Where get electrocuted. No, nope, that was twenty. Oh, that was, that was a kid. I know it was twenty. So there's power starting to go through the machine. You can hear it rumbling. It's starting to get a bit hot. There's heat coming from various places. There's steam coming out. That happens. You got electrocuted. It again. <laughs> I died. And to finally power up the machine, you have to do beat the buzzer game without letting the buzzer go off. Oh. 
Oh, what, first time? Just throwing it out there. I'm quite time. happy to admit that. I 100% touched the wire, then it didn't go off. That's fine. It's not overly sensitive, which is good. Right, right everyone, everyone, quiet, quiet, quiet in the stands, please. Oh, round the corner, round the corner. Oh, oh, oh. First time. What so what happens when they do that? The machine fires up. I start playing some crazy recorded messages and sirens, and then we have, <laughs> and then we have rifts in time and space open, and they get and go back to the future. Tiny little headers, tiny little brain in there. <laughs> so he. I mean, it's got a tiny little head. Look, I, I read somewhere that dogs have the brain capacity of a toddler. I could imagine. Well, they are. They're, they're like kids. Do you want to go catch some Pokemon? Do you want to go do Harry Potter? Get Pikachu. Yeah? Not really. Pikachu? We do. Yeah. Do you want to catch a Pikachu? Oh, Pikachu. Do you want to eat a Pikachu? Might be fun. Might be food involved. Number one at the top of the tree is what? Number one is the instigator. So the instigator is the person that comes up with all the juicy initial ideas about the plot and the law, the events that are currently ongoing. And then we go to stage two, the expander. So an expander is someone that looks at the stage one plot written by the instigator and expands on the instigator's plotline. Am I expander? I don't know, are you an expander? Sometimes. Are you an expander? I'm an instigator and an expander and also a stage three that we'll get into in a minute. Whoa, I know, whoa, whoa, whoa. we're moving into, into deep Scientology problems And here, that's so. dangerous. When are, we, when are we moving into Camelot Castle? Expanders are people that expand upon an instigator's plotline. So an instigator could say, we want one of, one of the southern realms to go to war, but we're not sure who we want them to go to war with. Looks at the possibilities that could happen from any one of those lines. Drills into it a bit more. Moves it back again and says, that's feasible. That possibly could work. That ain't really gonna work. Going back to the law of the world, and where in future we want the world to go. Fluffer. So a fluffer is someone who then does the real expansive work on a storyline put down by an expander. We then get down to the actual writing of the event that we actually start to form the event around this plot line. So everything that happens on the fluffers is very important because that also influences what's going to happen in the future. And it can also be reflected back on what the expanders and the instigators are doing. So it could be that a fluffer is writing some quite detailed and intimate plot, which then the expander reads and goes, oh, actually, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe we should focus a bit more on this avenue that you've really sort of drilled into. Mm. And then the instigator in turn looks back and, and says, oh, actually, yeah, this is gonna really affect the world plot. It keeps feeding itself back though, because what happens at events does feed back, even though there's a certain amount of planning goes into the future events, but it's all very player driven. You know, it's not preordained, the players dictate what happens. After and during the events, as you are saying, like the, the players will make choices that change how our plot is then directed. Reffing LARP events, so you get to know it after a while. I mean, we've been, when did we start the new events, 2015? It kind of works hand in hand, so you can see where the players are going with things. You have a rough idea of where chops and changes may be made according to player actions. You, you have to work with it on the day. The three stages generally work quite well. Yeah. Just stopped out, I don't know what else to say really. No, it's waffling us. Can I say bye? Bye. Bye.